Hi, and welcome back to another round of online economic lectures by yours truly, me, Mr. Schreiber. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about, obviously, economic theory. And there are two main components to this theory. I'll cover the first part in this one, and then the second component will be covered in another video. Hopefully, neither will be 15 minutes long, but it'll be easier if I break them up. But you will need to watch both of them to get a complete understanding of economic theory. But let's begin. The first thing to understand is there are two basic men and their ideas that we're going to talk about. Obviously, you can see their names here, Adam Smith and Karl Marx. Um, and we're going to in this video, we're going to talk about Adam Smith. And in the next video, we'll talk about Karl Marx. So let's begin. First thing, let's talk about what is economic theory. I guess the best way to understand economic theory is think of it as the people who think about economics. These are people who, just like it says, are the big thinkers. They want to know why do economic systems, capitalism, socialism, or command work the way they do? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And like it says here, the real idea is how they sort of evaluate. They analyze. They sort of consider the strengths and weaknesses of economic systems and really how they work to solve the economic dilemma. Um, there, in some ways, um, they help explain why certain systems work and why they do, and they also highlight some of the problems that certain systems have. And I like this picture here because obviously it's the idea of the thinker, the statue, and I think that's exactly the way you should think about these men. These are men that think about economics. So let's begin and talk about Adam Smith. Adam Smith, as you can see here, was a good-looking man. Um, he lived in the late 1700s, about the same time as the uh, American Revolution. And what he brings economics is a brand new sort of theory or an explanation about why economics works the way it does. And what he did is he wrote this book, which was called, as you see, a very nice long title, but most people just refer to as The Wealth of Nations. And in this book, he basically explains to people how nations can become rich and powerful. Um, it used to be that nations became powerful by expanding across, around the world, gathering up land and resources, and taking it back to their home country. That's what Great Britain did, that's what Spain did, and Portugal. What Adam Smith realizes in the late 1700s is that there's a different way to make money, to make a country powerful, to make it wealthy. And that revolves around producing goods. Okay. And so his title of his book really is saying, hey, if you want your country to be wealthy, this is what you should do. And what I'm going to spell out for you in the next several slides is his basic argument about why capitalism is such a good economic system, okay, the one that you and I obviously live in day to day. So here we go. The first key concept and probably the most important concept about Adam Smith in terms of how he explains the importance and the success of capitalism is called the invisible hand. And think of the invisible hand sort of like, as I show this picture here, kind of a scale in balance. That there are two competing components, as you can see here. Self-interest, which is balanced out by competition. And let's explain what I mean by each of these concepts. Self-interest is a very basic concept. <clears throat> Excuse me. We all have self-interest. We're all motivated to do things that benefit ourselves. You're watching this video because it's going to help you hopefully understand economic concepts and do well on the, in the class and on the test, pass economics, and take one step closer to graduate. I'm putting this video together because I get paid to. It's part of my job. We all do things because it benefits ourselves, and that's totally fine. In terms of a business perspective, what Adam Smith says is that businesses provide goods and services for one basic purpose. And as you can see here, it's money because they make profit. They're not concerned about consumers' well-being, how happy they are, how much they really enjoy the product. They're just interested in making money by producing goods and services that people want. Okay, And as I say here, if, the, if, if producers really had control over the whole economic system, they would raise prices as high as they could because obviously Starbucks, that's a good example, would love to charge $1,000 for a cup of coffee. Okay, And they would if they thought they could get away with it because they would obviously make more money at $1,000 a cup than the $2 that they're charging today. 
okay and you've all experienced this you've been in a store where you've had some sales associate who's played lots of close attention you've been really helpful but the minute the sale is made they move on to somebody else because that's in their self-interest and that's that's I think is a good example of this idea okay so of course companies don't raise prices through the roof and we and the simple answer is of course because there's just something that balances out this this self motivation for profit and that of course is competition okay in our economic system capitalism there are many companies that offer very similar products okay um, everyone who you think of all the different pairs of shoes you have the shoes are different in some very superficial way they all serve the same function okay at some point price comes into play okay all these businesses know that there are other companies offering products pretty much like theirs and so they have to be very careful about what they charge because they're all as it says buying for consumers okay and you know just a small change in price can make a huge difference we've talked before about you know thinking marginally that five cents difference on gas will cause people to buy a lot more a lot less this also explains this idea of invention innovations that cons that producers have to think about trying to make their products better somehow different than others okay okay the iPhone it was not the first cell phone but it was a much improved cell phone and Apple could sell it that way to people and people were willing to spend a lot more money on it because they thought it was somehow better than other phones and so that's what companies are always trying to do you know Apple will come out with some new product and then Samsung will come out with some new and supposedly better product and so on and so on but can producers do that because it's in their own self-interest to try to compete with these other companies for your business and it's only their self-interest motivation that makes them come up with newer and better products okay the outcome of this invisible hand is twofold number one you get lots of choices okay the reality is because there is so much competition okay companies are always trying to figure out ways to make their products stand out make them different and if you watch advertising you can see that that's exactly what they're doing they're trying to prove that this car is better than that car that this sneaker is somehow better that the this piece of clothing will somehow make you a happier person um, so you have lots of choices just go to your local Costco store or Walmart or Super Target and go down an aisle and look at all the different options you have for one product take again coffee there are dozens of different coffee makers okay who produce coffee just coffee beans that you can buy from same thing with sneakers again um, same thing with shoes I keep going back to the same examples but these are ones that you understand okay and along with those choices come low prices okay at the end of the day we are all self-interested in trying to buy things at their lowest possible price as consumers okay um, and of course because of this competition prices have to be kept relatively low because we will be very picky about how much we pay for products and again a little change will cause us to buy more or less of something so the key here is this invisible hand which you can't really see you can't really in point to but it really is happening all around you it's balancing out people's and producers self-interest with the reality that there is competition out there and we as the consumers benefit greatly because we have so many choices and so low prices and that is a huge plus to capitalism the next thing talking about what is the impact of this invisible hand along with what I just mentioned there's one other key one and that's called the good of the community and this is a very simple concept yet it confuses a lot of students so as it says here what it means is that in our economic system because of how it's set up the factors of production land labor capital entrepreneurs will shift they will move to where society needs them the most and they will do this all by themselves without any sort of motivation by any specific individual or group it just happens okay and another way to think about it is that the factors of production are recycled they continually move in the economy to where people consumers and producers want them they're never just sitting idly by kind of collecting dust if you will so what that means is that we have a very efficient economic system okay so the best way to explain this is to give you an example imagine if you go down to Aspen Grove and a business is going out of business okay it's closing its doors it's selling off its product and that's it okay well what happens next okay what happens to that storefront in Aspen Grove does it sit empty for weeks months years it might for a while but not forever do those workers keep showing up for work even though they're not being paid of course not do the cash registers and the shelves just stay there no okay what does the entrepreneur do all those factors of production go somewhere else the storefront opens up as a new store those workers go out and find new jobs 
those the capital, the, the tools that are used to make the product are sold off to somebody else. And the entrepreneur, they have to go back and come up with a better idea. But all those things, all those factors of reduction move without anybody telling them what to do. They just move on their own because it's in their own interest. But in this way, again, all the factors of production basically are always in use. They're never just being wasted by sitting on the sidelines. And that's a real huge benefit to our economic system. The last key concept to understand is called laissez-faire, which translates to let's do or let do. Okay, And this is a very simple argument. What, what Smith argues is capitalism is such a good and efficient system thanks to self-interest versus competition, which results in good of the community, those resources moving around by themselves. The government does not really need to be involved in the economy. Okay. They don't need to set prices. They don't need to set a lot of rules. He says everything will be decided by competition versus self-interest. <clears throat> Excuse me. He believes in, a, in, a, in an economic system with almost no government involvement, no direct government involvement in the economy at all. Now, that being said, he does believe that the economy is, that, excuse me, that the, that the government serves a, specific, a very important role in supporting the economy. And like it says here, what the government needs to do, it needs to provide certain products and services that will help capitalism work the most effectively and efficiently possible. And so there are certain, there's a certain role for government. Okay, so here are some examples, and you can see them here. Okay, the national defense, the court system, roads, and education. And what I'm saying with these things are, for example, companies that want to spend money on national defense, Apple, um, IBM, Ford, they don't want to hire an army to protect our borders from an invasion from Canada to Mexico, as unlikely as that is. They don't want to spend those resources. That would be a waste of their money and their time. Okay. But it makes them feel much more safer and they're much more willing to focus on their work if they know that there's an army out there to protect them. The court system here in green is one that I think is really important that most people don't think about. The court system protects people's ideas and products. Okay? So if producers come up with a great new idea, you go get a patent okay, or copyright. So if another company or person tries to steal it, you take them to court and sue the pants off of them and, and make them pay you. Okay? Apple did this with Samsung a few years ago and got a huge settlement in the billions of dollars. Okay? Consumers can, of course, use this as well to protect them against faulty products or services. But people know that their economic rights are being protected by the court system that has been created by the government and run by the government. It's not a private company, obviously, which could be very skewed to one side or the other. Roads are pretty obvious. Okay? We do not want to pay for all the roads we use. Okay? If private businesses built them, you'd have to pay for every single road. And if you think about it, E470 and or any toll road is the exact example of that. And in a few years, the, the, road, the road from Denver to Boulder will again be a toll road and you have to pay for it because that's a private company who's in charge of that. But for most roads, we just pay taxes and we get to use them free of charge. We don't worry about the cost because it's, it's in gas that we pay and in other forms of taxes. Okay? But private businesses, if they did it, they would charge you money every single time you used it. Obviously, education too. Okay? No company wants to spend money teaching you how to read or to write. Okay? They expect that people, when they hire someone, they have the basics and they will teach them the specifics that they know for their job. And that's exactly what will happen. That's what you're doing now. And that's what you do in college if that's your route or whatever you do after high school. You're going to develop certain skills that then a business will hire and they will teach you more specific skills that you need. Okay. So to go over it again, Adam Smith is a big supporter of capitalism. And there are three key reasons. The invisible hand, which leads to the good of community, and the idea of laissez-faire. Those are the three key concepts that you must know to understand Adam Smith. In the next video, we'll cover um, Karl Marx. Thanks for watching. Again, take good notes and feel free to ask questions in class. This is a little more complicated. Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye.